Okay, so let's uh, sit quietly for a few minutes to make sure our mind and body are settled. So be as relaxed as possible. If you notice tension anywhere in your body, see if you can release it. You can imagine it melting and flowing out of you, sinking down into the earth below. or that it just evaporates and disappears in space. And let your mind settle on the breathing, the breath flowing in and flowing out. So this brings our mind home to our body and to the present present place and present time. Let go of any other thoughts of the past, of the future, other places. Those are just thoughts in the mind. Thoughts are like clouds in the sky. They're not solid and permanent, but they appear, they disappear. So we don't have to take them so seriously. We'll put aside all other thoughts for now. Just let your mind be in the present. So let's briefly contemplate the points, the main points we were looking at yesterday. So as human beings, we are subject to death. This is something that happens to every person, every living being, as well as all other things in nature, human-made things, they all have their time and eventually they will all pass, go out of existence. So this is just nature and it's best to accept it, not um, deny it, try to escape from it. It's best to face this truth, this reality. But one problem is that we don't know when it's going to happen because everybody dies at different points in life. Some young, some middle-aged, some old, some very old. <clears throat> so there's no one who can tell us in a way we can find out when it will be our turn. So if we can recognize the importance of preparing ourselves for death so that we're ready for it when it arrives, then it's good to start doing that now, not procrastinate. And from the point of view of spiritual traditions such as Buddhism and other traditions, preparing ourselves for death doesn't just mean practical things like making a will, spiritual things as well learning how to manage our mind so that we can keep it positive as much as possible and free from disturbing, even destructive thoughts and emotions. So learning to manage our thoughts and emotions because the time of death could be quite challenging. could be lots of thoughts and feelings stirred up and it's best if we have a positive state of mind at that time. We need to learn how to do that now while we're still alive. And then it will be easy and natural at the time of death. And even before we face our own death, we'll most probably face the deaths of people we know and love. And naturally, we will feel the wish to help them at that time. <clears throat> so learning how to deal with death is beneficial for ourselves but also beneficial for others so see if you can feel the wish the motivation to learn something here during this last part of our weekend course that will be beneficial for yourself and for others both short-term now and also long-term, helping us 
move closer to our ultimate goal of awakening. I have quite a bit of material I would like to cover before we finish today, so I'm just going to jump right in, and hopefully there'll still be some time at the end for questions. So the next slide. Okay, so um, I'll start by looking at things that we can do to prepare for our own death. So there's a book called Facing Death and Finding Hope by Christine Longacre. This book's been around for a while. I think it was published in the 90s. And she has an interesting story. She was married and her husband had leukemia and he passed away when he was 25. She doesn't say how old she was, but she was probably about the same age or maybe younger. So that's pretty young to lose your spouse and they had a one-year-old child that she had to bring up on her own. So it was quite devastating for her. But sometime after his death, she began working for hospice in California and after about 20 years of experience working uh, with dying people, she wrote this book. She also became a student of Sogyal Rinpoche, who also did a lot of work with dying people and is the author of the book, um, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, which some of you may have read. It's a really, really excellent book. So this book is based on her own experience working with dying people, and it does bring in some Buddhist ideas, but it's not exclusively exclusively Buddhism or for Buddhists, so I think anybody could find um, benefit from this book. So I'm just going to briefly mention these four tasks. Um, <coughs> if, you know, if you want to know more, you can get the book, but just to briefly mention, she said, these are four things that we need to do to pre prepare ourselves for death, but they also help us in our life, and then they can also be beneficial for others. So the first of the four is understanding and transforming suffering. So as we die, there will most probably be some suffering. There could be physical. Not everybody has physical suffering. Actually, while I'm on that, I want to mention something, because we were talking about this the other night, pain and morphine. And um, I was reading this book about advice for future corpses, and I came across something in here that was interesting. I can find it. <clears throat> she says, the most common fear, but often the fear is not realistic, is about pain. Aging and terminal illness are not necessarily painful. I see many people in their 80s and 90s who are comfortable on a dose or two of acetaminophen. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Tylenol. Okay. <laughs> so just Tylenol is, can be enough. People, are, people who are dying often say they have no pain. And um, yeah, she says, research in hospice and palliative care shows that only about one in a hundred people has uncontrolled pain while dying. That doesn't mean no one has pain. <laughs> it means that 99 out of a hundred people who do have pain get relief. So that's good to know. I mean, I think that is a common fear that we have. We may have heard stories, we may have also seen people who are in pain when they died, but it isn't necessarily going to happen. And 99% of the time it doesn't happen. I mean, there probably will be some pain, but it could be manageable with small doses of Tylenol or morphine or something else. So that's a relief. <laughs> but nevertheless, there will be some suffering. Even if there isn't much physical suffering, there will probably be some mental suffering. Just the letting go of relationships and things and all the aspects of our lives. So it's, it's a challenging time. So she says, while we're going through life, it's useful to learn how to 
manage suffering rather than always trying to avoid it or escape from it or numb out um, but learn how to deal with suffering and this is very much a part of Buddhism first first noble truth <laughs> the truth of suffering it's part of everyone's life and but there are things we can do to um, to work with it to manage it and even transform it like she says here there's a whole body of teachings and practices in the Tibetan tradition that is called uh, transforming suffering into the path or sometimes it's called transforming adverse conditions into the path so whatever problem there is whether it's physical or mental or both problems with other people and so on any kind of problem that we face in life is is an opportunity for learning for growing so there are tools like methods that one can use to deal with this problem and learn from it grow from it and even make it part of your spiritual practice helping you get closer to enlightenment so i don't have time to go into that here but there are numerous books about this and um i think for me personally one of the best methods or tools is to use this situation to generate compassion to increase compassion because if you think I'm not the only person who has a problem like this there are many others just think about all the other people in the world maybe there are millions who have a similar problem to yours so that helps you feel better right away because you're not alone I'm not alone in this and you also probably can recognize some people have it worse than you do however bad it is for you it could be much worse for other people so then you're looking at your problem from that point of view it might seem not so bad and more manageable and then you can have more compassion you can understand how other people feel who are going through this problem and there's also a practice called tonglen that probably some of you are familiar with and there's in the back of this little book that I that I sent you preparing for death and helping the dying in the appendix there's a um, a very brief simple practice of Tonglen that you might want to try on your own or maybe in the next session before lunch whoever's leading that you might want to lead this session for those who haven't done this practice before but it's a really wonderful practice it gives you a lot of relief to your suffering it eases the suffering the suffering isn't so bad and it's very beneficial for your mind to have more compassion more love and so anyway there's lots of methods like that for transforming suffering so if we uh, learn these methods and practice these methods during our life we get used to them familiar with them then at the time of death it'll be much easier to use them and even transform the suffering at that time into something beneficial. The second point is making a connection, healing relationships, and letting go. Don't you? <laughs> so this has to do with our relationships with other people, our family, our friends, people around us there may be unresolved problems conflicts in in some of these relationships and um, this could be problematic at the time of death you know these the, the feelings the anger the resentment the hurt could come up in our mind and we might get stuck in those feelings and that would make it very hard maybe impossible to really die with a peaceful state of mind so if there's some distant relative that you have been in, at war with, you know, for decades. If they come to visit you, they walk in the room. Maybe your mind was peaceful before, but, you know. <laughs> so it's best to deal with those issues and clear them up while we can. Don't leave them hanging, yeah. And... Um, so that's basically the meaning of this you know heal whatever problems there may be whatever you know I, I mean of course it's not always possible to do that because you might be willing to forgive the other person but they may not feel the same way 
Okay, so there's no guarantee that you're going to be on the same page. But at least you can take care of your mind, your attitudes towards the other person. If they want to, if they're not ready to do that, well, that's okay. Just, you know, that's their thing. But at least in your mind, you know, try to let go of any anger, any resentments, any old hurts. Make peace with, with those people. So it's best to do this while we're still alive, while we still have time. Work on that. And, and if we do run into new problems, new conflicts with people, don't leave them hanging. Yeah, take care of them as quickly as possible. Just to illustrate that, I heard this story of a woman who um, had an argument with her son just before the son left uh, to go on a fishing trip with the father. So the mother and the son were arguing and angry at each other, and they were still angry when the son left. And then he didn't come home because there was some kind of accident. He died. So I think you can imagine how terrible the mother must have felt. It's bad enough losing a child, but the last experience, the last encounter, the last interchange with your child was an angry one, and you didn't have a chance to clear that up and hug and say, I love you, I forgive you. <laughs> right? So there must have been a huge amount of regret in her mind. So that could happen to any of us, you know, when somebody just goes off to work or goes off to the supermarket. You know, there's no certainty that they will come home. Right? That, thing, that kind of thing does happen. So try not to have arguments in the first place, but even if you do have arguments, don't let them stay there. Don't let them hang. Clear them up. And also letting go. We also need to learn to let go of people and not have this unrealistic attitude that we're going to stay together forever and ever and ever. That's part of attachment. Attachment feels, I want to be with you forever. I want you to be there forever. That's just not realistic. And if we have that attitude, that increases the suffering of separation. So it's better to gradually get used to the idea of impermanence and death, and we're, we will have to separate at some time. And in fact, if we learn to do that, if we do... Um, accept, acknowledge the truth of impermanence, I think it will benefit our relationships. Because if you realize that person's not going to be there forever, and you're not going to be here forever, then you really want to make the best of your time together. Yeah? You don't want to be mean and nasty to them. You'll, you'll appreciate them much more, appreciate the time you have together. Right? So I think it will enhance your feelings of love. I, f I experienced that with my mother, you know, when I knew that she was going to disappear soon. It was just, I felt the most incredible love for her that I never felt before in my life, you know. So she, you just realize people are really, really precious, and the time you have together is really precious. So you, you don't want to waste it with anger and arguments over things which are probably not very important. Okay, then the third point, preparing spiritually for death. This involves some uh, training ourselves in some spiritual practice. And I'll go into some um, suggested practices a little bit later. <clears throat> but um, just to mention what she says about that. She says, every religious tradition emphasizes that to prepare spiritually for death, it is vital that we establish right now a daily spiritual practice, a practice so deeply ingrained that it becomes part of our flesh and bones, a reflexive response to every situation in life, including our experiences of suffering. And Stephen Levine, who... Um, He's passed away now, but he was a Buddhist practitioner and teacher, and he also did a lot of work with dying people and wrote a number of books on dying. <coughs> he says in um, some Native American traditions, they have something called a death chant, which I guess members of the tribe are initiated into when they're adolescents. It sounds like a mantra, what we would call a mantra. So they learn this, this chant, and then they use it when... They're in times of need or fear or danger, you know, just to help them stay calm um, through that 
difficult situation. But the real purpose of the death chant is to use at the time of death when they're dying. You repeat that, recite that, focus on that, and that helps their mind to stay calm and clear through that through that time. So that's basically the idea of having a, a spiritual practice that can help us at the time of death to move through that experience without getting caught up in our fears and worries and other kinds of emotions that may come up in our mind. <clears throat> the fourth one, finding meaning in life. So this is one of the big questions probably everybody wonders about, at least sometime in their life, but sometimes people never find an answer to it. They wonder about it, but then they don't get an answer, and they just kind of go through life mechanically, like on autopilot, just going to work every day and doing all the things they're supposed to do, but without any deep sense of what it's all about. Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? And this can become problematic at the end of life, because at that point in time, you're probably not able to contribute much to society anymore. You're not able to work, and you maybe not be a you know, vital member of your family and your community. And you're just lying there. <laughs> you might be lying there for days, weeks, months. And uh, if you haven't managed to find a sense of meaning in life, then, then this could cause you to feel despair and depression and, you know, what was all this about and, and now they're suffering and why am I suffering? So it, it, of course, makes it very hard to have a positive state of mind at the time of death. So it's better while we're alive to find an answer to this question, to get a sense of meaning in life. And Buddhism and you know probably every religion, every spiritual tradition provides an answer to that. But we have to figure that out for ourselves. We have to decide for ourselves what is the meaning, what is the purpose of life. Yeah, so in Buddhism, those of us who follow this path, the purpose of our life is benefiting others as much as I can, as we can, and developing our spiritual potential, our potential for enlightenment. So and that's one suggested sense of meaning in life but you need to explore that think about that for yourself and come to an answer to that don't wait till you're you know it's almost over before you figure that out so that's her experience that that's a really important question to answer while we're still alive so if we work on these things while we're alive then they're very helpful as preparation for death and also helping others who die so i'm just abbreviating these but if you feel attracted, then I really recommend her book. It's wonderful. So now I'll talk about uh, point number three in more detail, preparing spiritually for death. Some things that we could do to, um, to be prepared for death. So um, one is living ethically. And... Um, in, in Buddhism, ethics mainly means living in a non-harmful way, understanding that all living beings, and that includes not just human beings, but animals, insects, all, any living being, that all living beings value their life, and they don't want to die, they don't want to suffer. So the bottom line in Buddhist ethics is living our life in such a way that we respect the lives of others and do the very best we can to not harm any living being <clears throat> and to help them, to take care of them, to feed them when they're hungry, <clears throat> protect them when they're in danger, give them comfort when they're afraid, and so on. Okay, so that's basically what it means to live ethically in Buddhism. And there's also um, more specific details such as uh, the Buddha taught ten actions, what we call the ten non-virtues, um, that are the most harmful actions that we could do. So we try to refrain from those as much as we can. And there's also um, the practice of taking vows or precepts. And there's different levels of vows, like monks and nuns take vows, but 
Um, there's also vows that can be taken by lay people who still want to live a normal life, not be a monastic. <clears throat> so there's like five precepts to not kill, to not steal, to not uh, tell lies, to not commit sexual misconduct, and to not take intoxicants, become intoxicated. So you can take any number of those. If you feel unable to take all five, you can take four, three, two, or even one. <laughs> And you can also increase. You can take one to start with and then later another one and so on. So taking vows or precepts is really helpful because it makes us a lot more mindful. You know, once you've made a promise to the Buddha, now, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. And you really try to live by that. It just helps you to have more mindfulness in your daily life. And even if you, you know, break it, even if you can't keep it perfectly, there's the practice of purification. So we... Like here in the Abbey, we do purification practice every day. And that's recommended to anybody who follows the Buddhist path at each day, especially at the end of the day. It's good to think back, what did I do today? Did I make any big boo-boos? Did I do anything, you know, break my precepts or whatever? And then do a purification of that. So they say there's nothing that can't be purified. You know, even murder. Um... So even really heavy, heavy negative actions that we may do can be purified if we do it in the right way with the four powers. So those are some of the things involved in living ethically. Um, and you can think about that, and if that makes sense to you, then you can start gradually. You know, start trying out some aspects of ethics, such as trying to avoid killing um, stealing and so forth and then you can increase over time your ability to but this is useful in preparation for death because um, if we don't live ethically if we live unethically that means you know we're creating negative actions non-virtuous actions at the time of death that could cause us to feel regret guilt worry fear what's going to happen to me next as a result of this so it's nice to be able to die without regret, without those kind of feelings in our mind. So if we really try to live our life to the best of our ability in an ethical way, that will free us from that problem at the time of death. Also, they say that um, people sometimes have visions before they die. Um, and these could depend on how we lived our life. So if we've done harmful things, like there's a story in the Lam Room about this Tibetan man who had slaughtered a lot of sheep. He was like a, a nomad and he had killed sheep. Before he died, he had this vision of a whole huge number of sheep kind of stampeding over him. And it was very frightening, very disturbing. And a friend of mine was with his father when he died. And just before he died, he had a, a kind of vision of the city where he lived being on fire. The whole city burning. doesn't sound very um, positive. So these visions can... Uh, well, and then if you... <laughs> so if you've done a lot of harmful things or negative things, you might have these frightening visions. But on the other hand, if you've done a lot of positive things, virtuous things, then you can have very beautiful visions, you know, like the heavenly gates opening up, or Amitabha's pure land, or deities. You know, people sometimes see deities, Buddhas, at the time of death. So those are very positive. So depending on how we lived our life, then we can have these different kinds of visions or experiences that could be either frightening or uplifting. <clears throat> so again, that's another reason why it's important to try to live ethically. While we're alive. Okay, the next one is practice meditation. Yeah, even little kids can do meditation. <laughs> um, so there's many different kinds of meditations. So I, th I think everybody should be able to find one practice that... Um, that they feel good about, that works for them, and so on. Mindfulness is a very popular one. <clears throat> it's, it's become quite mainstream. Um, you know, we have mindfulness in businesses, mindfulness in sports, my, even in the military. 
Um, so lots of people are practicing mindfulness, and you don't really have to be religious to do it. And it does definitely help to um, be more aware of what's going on in the mind. I mean, according to Buddhism, the purpose of practicing mindfulness isn't just to be more relaxed and enjoy life better, but it's to be on the lookout for disturbing thoughts and emotions such as anger, attachment, jealousy, and so forth, so that you can notice these when they're just starting to arise in the mind and do something about them, deal with them before they totally take over, hijack our mind. So that's the real purpose of mindfulness. Um, and, and then also trying to keep in mind positive thoughts, positive attitudes like kindness, love, compassion, being on the lookout for others and whatever they need and helping them. <clears throat> so, and it can be helpful at the time of death because there could be lots of disturbing thoughts and emotions that come up at that time and our mind could just be like kind of flooded with these. So if we've never learned how to deal with those during our life, it could be quite difficult at that time, whereas if we've learned to um, manage them, then we won't be so upset. I mentioned Mori, Two Stays with Mori. Did anyone read that book? Because he, um, he was doing some kind of practice. I think he mentioned a teacher coming in, and it's probably mindfulness, probably someone from the Insight Meditation Society, because he lived over in the East Coast. So he was practicing mindfulness, and that really helped, because for you know, sometimes he just feel this panic coming up, or this great sadness about leaving behind his family. So he was, he would just watch that. He would just observe that, knowing that it was impermanent. It would pass. So having that awareness really does allow those disturbing thoughts and feelings to pass more quickly. Whereas if we get caught up in them and then we feed them, it's almost like putting more fuel on the fire. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. But if we know they, they're just like clouds in the sky, they're going to pass. And we can ride them <laughs> and they will pass more quickly. So it, it can be very, very helpful at the time of death. But to be able to do it at that time, it's good to learn now, you know, get get some familiarity with the practice now. But there's other kinds of practices as well, other kinds of meditation. So if that one doesn't work for you, you can try other ones. And, oh, maybe I didn't mention this before. Yeah, this is Maury. <laughs> I thought I already did this yesterday. <laughs> this is Maury Schwartz. This is the real guy, um, Tuesdays with Maury. This is a photograph. Of, yeah, the guy on the left. <laughs> so it's a very inspiring story, if you haven't already read it, Tuesdays with Maury. It was on the bestseller list, I don't know, back in the 90s. A true story. So he was a professor, sociology, I think, somewhere in the East Coast, and he got ALS, is it ALS? So gradually, starting from the feet up, you know, his, his body was shutting down, becoming paralyzed. And um, one of his former students, whose name I can't remember, Mitch, Mitch, Alburn, something like that. So he's the guy over on the right. So he came to visit Maury, and they decided to collaborate on a book. Uh, so every Tuesday... Mitch would fly from Chicago to Boston and meet with his old teacher for a couple of hours. And Maury would share his wisdom, things he had learned in life, really, really beautiful, wonderful things. And then it was made into a book. And he died in the end, but he was just amazingly kind and compassionate and positive and joyful to the people around him. Yeah, so it was, it's just very inspiring to, to know that somebody can die that way rather than miserable and depressed and bringing everyone around you down as well. And they made a movie out of it, um, which you can watch on YouTube. <laughs> it's very inspiring because it's a true story. So it just shows that, you know, death doesn't have to be a horrible experience for you and everyone around you. It can be quite um, uplifting and positive. So 
that I'm putting this together with loving ca- kindness and compassion because these are the qualities that Maury had and uh, was able to bring to the people around him. And if we can have these qualities in our mind, they're also beautiful. My teacher, Lama Zopirimbache, said these are the best kind of thoughts and feelings that we could have in our mind as we are dying, before we are dying, during death. They're, they're very positive, they're virtuous, they're joyful as well. You know, when you, when you can feel kindness and compassion, your mind is uplifted, your mind is positive, joyful, as opposed to being grumpy and miserable and depressed and angry and sorry for yourself and all those kind of things. So, yeah. But to be able to do that at the time of death, we need to be familiar with it while we're alive. Right. So this is a big part of Buddhist practice. The four measurable thoughts, one of the prayers that we recite every day, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness, may all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering, and so on. So even just to learn that prayer, it's quite simple and easy, and just spend a couple of minutes every day reflecting on it, and then really try to be that way during our day with the people we meet. Try to be attentive, concerned, kind, compassionate. So if we do that during our life, then it becomes just our natural way of being, and it'll be much easier to have those qualities in our mind at the time of death. And it's also a helpful way to have less suffering. Um, I mentioned that already with, you know, when we, when we do have some suffering, if we think about the suffering of others, then we realize we're not the only one to suffer. Because what happens when we're in pain or unhappy the mind tends to get obsessed with my problem, my suffering, almost as if I'm the only person in the world who's got problems. Everybody else is happy, doing well, flourishing, and I'm the only one. Have you ever noticed that? It's, I don't think we do it deliberately or consciously. It's just a tendency the mind slips into. And that just makes us feel worse, right? Um, also because then we feel cut off from others. You know, almost like I'm on an island all by myself and everybody else is over there on the shore just having a party, having a great time and poor old me, you know, I'm suffering. It's just not true. I mean, that's the remarkable thing. It's absolutely wrong, (laughs) not true at all. So by just thinking, okay, other people have problems too. Other people have problems. Everybody has problems. I'm not the only one. Then we feel more connected with others rather than isolated and alone. And like I say, then we can also realize some people have worse problems than me. Yeah. So then that kind of diminishes the suffering that we have because we realize, well, it's really not that bad. It could be worse. And then it can seem more manageable. His Holiness the Dalai Lama tells a story about this in his experience. One time he was in India and he got really, really bad pain in his belly somewhere. I think it was the gallbladder maybe. So they were driving him to the hospital and it was a long drive and they were going through these little Indian villages and he was sitting in the back seat, you know, in great pain. But he would look out the window and see people, little children dressed in rags, skinny and obviously not well taken care of, well fed, or elderly people just lying there on the ground seemingly with no one to care for them. And he was just so moved by the suffering that he saw. It just took his attention away from his own suffering and it didn't seem so bad. So so it's really helpful then to think about the suffering of others. That doesn't mean we should ignore our own suffering and not try to deal with it. We can still do that, you know seek medical attention or whatever to deal with our own suffering, but just focusing on the suffering of others really helps to cool down or tone down whatever suffering we're experiencing, and it increases our compassion and our love for others. Yeah, so at the time of death, we can be thinking about others, wishing them to be happy, wishing them to be free of suffering, then... This is a really good thing to do 
for ourself and for the people around us. Then, next one. Um, so, this is more of a traditional spiritual practice. In Buddhism, we talk about taking refuge. So this is um, the, the feeling or the attitude we have with regard to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, what we call the three jewels. The Buddha, his teachings, and the Sangha, the people following this path. So when we've studied some Buddhism and thought about it and come to the point where we feel, yeah, I want to follow this path, then we take refuge. But taking refuge is something we do every day and try to live our life within taking refuge, feeling that the Buddha is there with us all the time and ready to help us. So we're never alone and isolated and um, abandoned. So this is particularly helpful at the time of death because at that time we're leaving behind our friends and family, all the people, all the things of our life, so it could be quite scary from that point of view and you can easily feel alone and abandoned. So to know that we're not really alone. I can't remember if I said this yesterday or not, but one of my teachers, Lama Zopar Mbache, has said, we're never alone. There's always countless Buddhas and Bodhisattvas around us all the time, looking at us with loving kindness and compassion and ready to help us. We just need to turn our mind to them and open our hearts to them and receive their, their help. So this kind of practice may not appeal to everybody. Some people may feel doubt or it's just not their cup of tea. But for those who do feel inclined to this, it is, it is a very helpful thing. But it's, again, helpful to cultivate this during our life, to get, train ourselves in this kind of practice during our life. When I was in Singapore many years ago, one time I was asked to go to the hospital to uh, visit a woman who was apparently very, very frightened because she had just been diagnosed with cancer and the next day was going to have to go for an operation. So she was just like apparently freaked out with fear. I didn't know this woman, but she, it was a friend of a friend. So I went to visit her and I walked into the room and she was standing there looking completely <laughs> like bright and happy. And I yeah, so she said, yeah, the previous day she had been really, really frightened. But that night, or the night before I saw her, she had a dream in which she saw Kuan Yin. Kuan Yin is, um, well, we have statues all over the place of Kuan Yin. It's the Chinese version of Avalokiteshvara, very popular in, among Chinese. So she, she saw Kuan Yin in her dream and that gave her the sense that she wasn't alone and everything was going to be okay. Kuan Yin was there to look after her, to take care of her. So that took away her fear. So that's a, an example. You know, if you're that kind of person who is more devotional by nature, who can relate to that kind of practice, then that can be very, very helpful. So we have, you know, the Buddha and many other Buddha figures as well, Chen Rezik, or Kuan Yin, Tara, Medicine Buddha also um, is particularly good. My, my teacher, Lama Zopar Mishai, said, Medicine Buddha is really the best practice to do before death, during death, after death, <laughs> both for the person dying and the people around. And um, I was just thinking, too, there was a story I read, I think it was in Sogyal Rinpoche's book, about a woman in New York who had cancer and had tried every possible cure and treatment, medicine, but nothing worked. So she was on her way out. And she went to see um, this great Nyingma master, Dujo Rinpoche, to ask for a practice that she could do to help her die and have a good rebirth. And he gave her the practice of medicine, Buddha. So she started doing that practice, and then she didn't die. Her cancer was cured. <laughs> so, yeah, very powerful. Um, so there's many, many different Buddhas, and you don't have to practice all of them. You, you know, you might feel a particular affinity for one or the other, and it's good to focus on mainly one. You can do more than one if you want to, but you don't have to. So... 
think it's good to have at least one of the Buddha figures that you feel connected with and that you take refuge in and pray to during your life and then feel that that Buddha is there um, with you as you're dying. Okay, then next one is um, studying spiritual teachings. So the word study, I don't know, maybe that is a little off-putting. It doesn't mean like studying for an exam, but just making ourselves familiar with, acquainted with spiritual teachings. Because the spiritual, spiritual teachings come from beings who s- devoted their entire life to prayer and practice and meditation and humanitarian work and cultivating all these positive qualities and wisdom. So they have a huge amount of wisdom and the words that they have spoken or written are you know, contain that wisdom. So that can be very, very helpful to prepare for death. So if you feel inclined to study, there's study programs you can do. But this could also mean just having a book that you have by your bedside and you read a few pages before you go to bed at night just to familiarize yourself, acquaint yourself with the words of wise and compassionate beings. And what you might find is you know, even if you just read it once, but it's at a certain point, in a certain situation, those words might come up in your mind, almost like that teaching is there and it pops up when you need it. So that's very helpful to do during our life, so that we, you know, like planting seeds in our mind of these words of wisdom and compassion, and then those could come up at the time of death and give us solace and advice for dealing with this difficult time. Okay, next. So this is a practice, the five powers. This is a practice that comes from the mind training tradition, Lo Jong in Tibetan. Lo is mind and Jong is training. So it's mind training or thought training. So this is a um, body of teachings and practices that are all about how to um, cultivate altruism, love, kindness, compassion, and to decrease self-centeredness and other kinds of disturbing emotions. <coughs> Pema Chodron has probably made this this kind of teaching very famous because <laughs> her books are very well known and she talks a lot about Lo Jong. But other teachers do as well, so you may have heard of it before. So within this tradition of Lo Jong, there are these what are called five powers that we practice during our life, but particularly at the time of death. And it's said to be the best poa. Yesterday, Alex was asking about poa, which is a little bit of an esoteric practice where you visualize your consciousness going into Amitabha's heart. So that's fine to do. But it said that this is actually the best poa. This is the best way to ensure that when we die, our consciousness leaves this body, that it will go to a good place. Okay, so just briefly, um, the first one is called the power of the white seed. And this involves um, uh, creating virtue, doing doing virtuous things, like planting good seeds, positive seeds on our mind. So we, of course, we try to do this while we're alive, but we can also do it before we die. For example, give, give things away. <laughs> if you haven't already made a will, you know, just give your stuff away. That helps us to overcome attachment, but it's also a way of practicing giving, generosity, benefiting others, making others happy. <clears throat> Um, and any other virtuous practice, any kind of practice like meditating on emptiness, if you know how to do that, or uh, doing purification practices, um, refuge, taking refuge in the three jewels, meditating on love, compassion, bodhisattva, uh, bodhicitta. So any kind of positive, virtuous things that we can do Um, before we die. It's like adding more positive seeds to our mind that will benefit us in the next life, but also for a long-term goal, enlightenment. 
Um, the next is power of intention. <coughs> so this means generating really strong, pure, positive uh, resolutions, or intentions, motivations. For example, I will really do my best to not let my mind come under the control of negative and disturbing emotions like anger or you know, self-pity or jealousy or whatever. So even if those arise, they probably will arise, but be very determined to deal with them, manage them, not let yourself get totally caught up in them. And also having the intention to do the very best you can to maintain altruism and kindness and compassion, even if people around you might be doing things that are annoying or irritating. But, you know, <laughs> Try not to complain, but be patient with them and kind to them. So whatever, whatever positive um, attitudes we, we could have, just having that intention to keep your mind in a positive state as much as possible. And um, so just as an example, to think, no matter what happens, may I always have love and compassion for all beings and use whatever experience I have to help me get closer to enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. And then with regard to the next life, to make this wish or this aspiration that you know, one could be born in a situation where one would be able to continue practicing the Dharma, benefiting sentient beings, wanting to be of benefit and not harm as much as possible. So making that kind of aspiration. And the third is the power of counteracting negativity. So being on the lookout for the arisal of negative disturbing emotions such as anger, attachment, jealousy, selfishness, and so forth. And um, <clears throat> having this resolution to deal with them wisely, not letting yourself get caught up in and carried away by them. Or even if that does happen, you know, to pull yourself back as quickly as possible and deal with that state of mind and replace, replace it with something positive. And also purification. So it's really recommended that before we pass away, we do as, mon as many purification practices as we can. Especially if we remember things that we've done during our life that we feel regret for. Don't get stuck in regret and guilt, but there's practices for purifying that. So do those practices. And if you have difficulty doing any of these practices on your own, invite friends Hopefully there'll be um, like-minded friends, practitioners around you who could help you to do these practices. And this is something we, in the Dharma will, there's um, opportunities there where you can say, specify, these are the practices I want you to help me with before I die. <laughs> then number four, power of prayer. So it's recommended that we make strong prayers before we die that you know, we will never be separated from spiritual teachers, spiritual teachings, opportunities to continue our practice, our development of bodhicitta and wisdom and so on and so forth. So we make strong prayers for that. We do need to do that to ensure that our next life and subsequent lives will be good ones, good in the sense that we'll be able to continue our spiritual practice and not go backwards. And uh, another prayer we can make at that time, this is related to the practice of Tonglen. If we do have any suffering, any difficulties um, at the time of death, we can make the prayer that by going through these experiences, by having these experiences, the suffering and problems of all living beings will be allevi alleviated, will disappear. Okay, that's a kind of um, tonglen or taking giving practice. So, you know, if I have pain and I can think, <clears throat> may all living beings' pain come into my pain and by my experiencing this pain, going through this pain, may all of their pain be relieved. It sounds a bit scary, but it's actually quite amazing when you do that. It doesn't make the pain worse. It actually makes it better. 
because you know part of pain is also how we react to it our mental uh, response we think if we have pain and we think oh this pain is terrible oh I can't stand it oh like we kind of make it worse than it is whereas if we do something like this bring in compassion and altruism our mind is changed with regard to the pain and it actually becomes bearable and it may even disappear I've had that happen it kind of goes away altogether so if you fight it and resist it it makes it worse if you accept it and transform it into something positive, then it's, it's kind of magical. Last is the power of familiarity. And this just means whatever we are most familiar with or habituated to is what will arise most easily and naturally in our mind. If we're familiar or habituated with getting angry, then that's what's going to come up in our mind at the time of death. <laughs> if we're familiar with compassion, thinking about others, caring for others, then that's what will come up in our mind. That's just natural. And I guess in the, in the language of neuroscience, they would talk about neural pathways. Yeah? So we, we, have, a, we have choice there. We have control there. What kind of... Uh, things we make ourselves most familiar with. So if we understand that, then well before we die, it's good to familiarize ourselves with positive states of mind, beneficial states of mind, so that they can arise easily and naturally, and defamiliarize ourselves with the negative ones. You know, don't go down those roads as much as possible. So again, I'm just explaining these very briefly, but... Um, there are books in which these are explained more. I think in the back of the book, there's a recommended reading list where you can find out more, more books about Lojong mind training. Okay, so, rushing along. <laughs> it's okay if we go a little bit late. This meditation will be short. Okay, so next is... Um, helping others die. So this is a big thing too, but like I said yesterday, if we do these, if we do the work of preparing for our own death, then it's easier to deal with other people who are dying. If we've never done anything to prepare for death ourselves, then we'll be in trouble. Okay, so that's why the first point here is prepare for your own death. <laughs> so if we do these, you know, learn to accept the reality of death, learn how to work with disturbing emotions. Actually, that's the next point. <laughs> learn to manage your disturbing emotions. So this is a big part of Buddhist practice, learning how to work with, to manage, and even transform disturbing emotions such as anger, fear, jealousy, depression, and so on. If we can learn how to manage those in our mind, then it's really, really good for ourselves, for our own death, but also when it comes to somebody else who's dying. Because when we're faced with the death of a friend or a family member, it's quite possible that disturbing emotions will come up. Sadness, fear, uh, anger, attachment. And if we've never learned how to deal with our disturbing emotions, then we could be overwhelmed by them. And, and then our ability to give help to this person who's dying will be very much diminished. We're the one who will need help. But, I mean, that's okay. You know, if we recognize that we still need help, we can go and seek help on our own. But when we're with someone who's dying, it's best what I've heard, they, I've heard in hospice, they say, leave your baggage outside the door. You know, don't carry your baggage in to the room where you're visiting the dying person. Don't burden them. They've already got enough to deal with. You know, they don't need your problems as well. So learn to um, manage your disturbing emotions on your own. And if you can't do that on your own, seek help. There's plenty of people therapists, spiritual teachers, good friends that you can turn to for help with your disturbing emotions. So this doesn't mean suppressing them. Um, 
ignoring them, pretending they're not there. You do need to learn how to work with them. But when you're with the person who's dying, it's best to put them outside the door or <laughs> put them aside for now so that you can really um, focus your attention on helping that person. And, and the next point, number three, is giving hope and finding forgiveness. So this is actually in the book, uh, Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And the idea here is that when people are dying, they often experience guilt, regret, depression, or even a sense of hopelessness. They may feel really bad about things they did during their life or things that they didn't do but wished they had. So they might get stuck in such states of mind which wouldn't be very helpful. I mean, from the Buddhist point of view, helping someone who's dying ideally is helping them be in a positive state of mind. Although we can't force that. We can't expect to do that. It's impossible to go into somebody's mind and fix it so that they're in a positive state of mind. So we need to recognize that. We can't actually do it for them, but we could help them to be in a positive state of mind, help them not be in a negative state of mind. We can at least try, but there's no guarantee that it'll work, but it's worth trying. So if the person is feeling guilty or depressed or despair, hopelessness, then it's helpful to listen to them, let, give them a chance to talk. They might, they might want to confess something. They've never confessed before to anybody else and that could be really helpful for them to get that off their chest as we say and uh, try not to be judgmental <laughs> whenever they tell you it might be hard but try not to be judgmental try to be like the Buddha total un unconditional love and compassion and forgiveness um, and it's also helpful to encourage them to remember positive things that they did in life Sometimes the person is only focusing on the mistakes that they made, bad things that they did. But I'm, I'm sure everyone has done good things. For example, if they were a parent, they brought up kids, they gave the kids the best life that they could. Okay, so that's something positive. And I'm sure there's many other things as well. That they just need to be reminded of those things and feel good, you know, that their life wasn't a total disaster, total help hopeless okay so that's the meaning behind that try to give the person hope and find forgiveness For forgiveness of their self like we were talking about yesterday if the person believes in God then um, you could talk to them in that term um, that God is forgiving God will forgive you whatever you've done um, or if they believe in Buddha or whoever they believe in now just assure them that there is forgiveness for them. They do deserve forgiveness. They are worthy of forgiveness. They need to accept that themselves. They need to forgive themselves. So try to do that. You may not, it may not work, but it, it's worth trying. And the next point is um, the environment. It's good to, if you have the ability or the power to do this, um, to create a a nice environment, peaceful and beautiful. Um, I think many hospitals and hospices know this already, so the color of the walls and the kind of artwork and so forth is to create a peaceful environment. If the person is a religious person, a religious practitioner, then it's good to put pictures of their teachers or the objects of refuge like the Buddha or Jesus or whatever inside of them on their bedside uh, table so that they can view those and be reminded of their religious beliefs and practices. <coughs> it's also try to, it's good to try to have the atmosphere as quiet and peaceful as possible. Um, but we also shouldn't, I was in this book um, about advice for future corpses, I think it wouldn't be good to impose our ideas 
on the other person and expect them to comply. If they want the TV on watching wrestling or football or something, and we may think, that's not good for you, <laughs> or I don't want to watch that, then we have to respect the person's choice. <laughs> that's what they want. <laughs> Trying to impose our own ideas might just make them agitated and angry. <laughs> They don't want us to come anymore. So we do have to be sensitive to that. And then number five, um, help the person remember and practice spiritual teachings and practices according to their faith. So this is really important, again, that we don't impose our ideas and practices on the other person, but respect them. If they're a Catholic, like my mother, you know, don't try to get her to think of Buddha and pray to Buddha, uh, that wouldn't be appropriate, and vice versa. So whatever, if the person does have religious beliefs and practices, talk to them about that and try to help them to remember those, practice them, have faith in their object of refuge. And if they don't have any religious beliefs or practices, if they're atheist or whatever, you could use words from psychology, language of psychology, to try to encourage the person to have a positive state of mind. That's the essence. That's like the bottom line. Just try to help the person not be negative and instead be positive. But you have to kind of feel out the person and the situation, what works and what doesn't work. And then the last point is um, even after the death, after the person has passed away, you can continue to meditate, pray, recite mantras and so forth because according to Buddhism, at least Tibetan Buddhism, it's possible that the person's mind or consciousness will remain in the body for some hours or even some days. And also even when it does leave the body, they are in what we call the bardo, the intermediate state. And it's still possible to affect their karma and next rebirth. So traditionally, in the Tibetan tradition, also in the Chinese tradition, prayers are said for someone who's passed away uh, up to 49 days. That's the maximum amount of time the person would be in the intermediate state. So we continue praying for their good rebirth <coughs> during that time. And you can also... Um, do virtuous actions, meritorious actions, make offerings, for example, donations, and dedicate it to the person who's passed away. So this is just brief, um, a few ideas, and there's more information in the book if you want to read it. And there's also lots of other books, like this one. <laughs> this is very good. I've been reading it. It's very... Very interesting. And it has a lot of practical advice as well. For example, there's a whole chapter on communication. What to say and what not to say. There's certain things that we might say, even with a good intention, but they could be upsetting uh, to the person who's dying. Also, I wanted to recommend this book. Some people may not have heard of it. It's called How to Be Sick. Since most of us will probably die of chronic illness, so we might be sick for a while before we die. So the author of this book is a woman named Toni Bernhard, and she was a law professor at University of California, Davis. And one day in 2001, she got sick, and it looked like just a bad cold or the flu, but it never went away. So even after 18 years, she's still sick. And that means she had to give up her career, she had to change her whole lifestyle, and uh, most of the time she's in bed, sometimes with a lot of pain, but most of the time just unable to do anything, just totally exhausted. So uh, she had already been learning Buddhist meditation and practices for 10 years or so before this happened, so she used her practices to deal with her difficulties. So that's what this book is all about. <laughs> it's really, really nice. And apparently a lot of people have found it helpful, not just people who are sick, physically sick, but also she said she's heard from people who um, suffered with other kinds of problems like chronic mental illness, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, PTSD. Okay, so just very, very simple down-to-earth practical ways of dealing with 
sickness and other kinds of problems. And she's written a few other books as well, but this is the first one. And it's got a, there's a new version that just was published last year, um, revised and updated. So that could be useful for you, or if you know somebody who's chronically ill, then it's good for anybody. It's, it's kind of very universal, not just for Buddhists, but... Yeah. So anyway, it's been a little rushed <laughs> this last bit, but I hope all of you have learned something beneficial from this. Do, do we have time for questions? Any last burning questions, Ken? And you had alluded to this. Um, pain is very interesting. Uh, I've been exploring it, you know, myself personally. How much of it is end organ, um, like I have a knee that's bothering me, and, and how much of it is in my mind, you know, mind state. And um, you hear about, you know, high-level bodhisattvas that uh, you can cut off their leg and they experience no pain. Um, and the, the mind training techniques. Uh, you had mentioned... Uh, about Tylenol, um, interesting, Tylenol works on the brain centers, the, so it's not an end organ thing like uh, aspirin or uh, naproxen would be. So there definitely is two aspects to pain, you know, there's the end organ, uh, but the, then there's also the, the brain or the mind, and uh, you know, one wonders um, with uh, higher levels of uh, mind training, how much we can do uh, short of being a, a bodhisattva to, you know, to control <laughs> some of uh, our pain. And, um, I mean, the thing about bodhisattvas, um, this ability to not feel pain occurs in bodhisattvas who have a direct realization of emptiness. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's that direct realization of emptiness that's the powerful painkiller. <laughs> <laughs> but but there's I, I, I'm sure there's much we can do with our mind yeah. states. You know our feelings of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, which is driven by our karma. We can do a lot, you know, to try to interrupt that. Yeah, and I want to recommend something. There's a book called Mindfulness in Plain English by Bhante Gunaratana, who's a Sri Lankan monk who's been living over in Virginia, I think, for West Virginia for a long, long time. And there's a number of books of his. One is called Mindfulness in Plain English. You can actually get it online. as a free version online. And in there, there's a, a section on pain. Um, and he actually recommends a mindfulness technique to use with pain. And I've tried it myself, and I've also led it with groups of people. And some people say their pain just goes away. And it really is looking at not just the physical, but the mental. Because he says mentally, our mind is resisting it. And, that al and also physically, there's tension around that area. And if we can focus on it, relax the physical tension, and then relax the mental tension, the pain becomes more bearable, and sometimes it goes away altogether. So you could look into that. It's very helpful. Well, I saw Alex first. I'll take him first, and then Jay. It's real quick. Um, to what extent do we, as or those of us that identify as Buddhists, um, participate in the spiritual practices of our dying loved ones to help support them? If, let's say, you know, your mother's Catholic, you know, was Catholic and wanted to say the Rosary, to what extent do we? Participate I would do it with her. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's up to you. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, you could invite a priest you know, to come and do it with her. But, um, yeah, if she's, if the person is open and happy and, but also, like, I was visiting a woman in Singapore who was dying and she was just really, really weak. So she, this is often the case, the person just doesn't have the energy or the mental strength to be able to do the practice. So then it's really helpful to do it with them or for them. That's a great blessing, a great gift to give. Yeah, actually, Lama Zopermishe says, you know, the greatest gift we can give to someone is to help them die peacefully. So it's like a wonderful opportunity to <laughs> benefit someone and also 
ourselves, further ourselves along the path. Jay? So two and a half years ago, I had my first experience of a close friend dying. He went out cross-country skiing and just didn't come home. And when his wife told me about it, also my good friend, she said the last thing she said to him as, she went out, as he went out the door was, I'll see you later. And of course, she never did, except his corpse. And when she told me that story, you could hear the regret in her voice. And I think that experience touched me more than his death did and really changed my practice and my attitude towards people so that I make sure that every time I leave the house, my wife knows how much I love her. Mm. And so that when I look around this room, I want to make sure that that's imparted. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the things, if we really familiarize ourselves with the truth, the reality of impermanence and death, we just never know when it's going to happen to ourselves or to our loved ones. So having that awareness really, like I say, it really, you really value your relationships and people and really want to make the best of them. So kindness, <laughs> kindness and compassion as much as possible. Every minute, every second. The last five years of my mom's life, she had dementia. And so I would, when I was there, I would take her to Mass in my nun outfit. And then when she was, and on the way to church, every time she would turn to me and she'd say, are you a Catholic? And I'd say, <laughs> I'd say no, Mom, I'm a Buddhist. And she'd say, really? <laughs> and then that was it. She was happy with the answer. And then when she was in the hospital dying, I would get the YouTube videos going and I would sing Latin hymns with her and so it was just beautiful because she knew all the words and um, you know this music would be floating down the hospital hallway and everyone heard it but it, she was just blissed out singing these hymns maybe that's a good point to end <laughs> bliss <laughs> bliss and love and compassion <laughs> so I hope some little seeds have been planted for further exploration of this topic and practice. That's the most important thing. You know, don't just leave it in your notebooks or your computer, but practice as much as you can, but in a reasonable way. Yeah. We also have to... There's this one analogy they give of the pace of our practice, that it's good to be... to, to practice like the, the way an elephant walks, slowly but is able to go a long way, powerful. So I guess it's similar, we have this story of the hare and the rabbit. You know, it's better to be like the hare. I mean, what am I saying? <laughs> the tortoise and the hare. Better to be like the tortoise, you know? Slow but steady and going a long way rather than a little bit here and a little bit there and then backwards and stopping and taking a nap. So just keep going in our practice. Steady and sure. <laughs>